So we are, we are to add to our virtue, knowledge. This is a knowledge that enriches. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, it says, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God, which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance. And in all knowledge, knowledge comes from an understanding and a relationship with Jesus Christ. Given by him, Colossians chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea. And for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh that their hearts might be comforted, being knitted together in love and unto all riches, the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You see where we get wisdom and knowledge from? They are hid in Christ. No shortcuts. You got to go through Jesus. If you want to have wisdom, if you want to have knowledge that leads to right living. The third thing I look at today is the next step, which says to add some temperance. Add temperance. What's temperance? That's self-control. Self-control. It is defined as the virtue of one who masters his desires, masters his passions, especially his sensual appetites. What are the sensual appetites? That's relating to or involved in gratification of the senses and physical, especially sexual pleasures and desires. So let me go back again. To your knowledge, you're to add temperance. You're to add self-control. You're supposed to put some boundaries and set boundaries in your life that will cause you not to run away and cause your emotions and your hormones to take you down a path that you don't want, not that you don't want to go, that God does not expect for you to go. Even though it may be something that your body is longing and craving for, self-control curbs you, puts a leash and a shackle on you so that you will not disrespect God and your body. Self-control can also be Translated to other areas of life. And I like to make examples of myself. I know where I need to practice self-control. And that's here. In eating. What I put into my body. There's things I can choose not to. I don't have to eat everything that I see. I don't. I don't have to look at everything that you see online, on the internet, because some things can corrupt, can corrupt the mind, can corrupt the soul. Self-control. Also, when it comes to things like anger, you know the saying that we have, you're going from one to 99 in a second, Something may anger you and you just gone off on your rocket. Self-control. How many of you have self-control? How many of you need to ask God for some more self-control? I do. That's another key ingredient that we need to see spiritual growth in our lives. And we see it also stated in Galatians chapter 5. 
verse 22 to 24. But the fruit of the spirit is love. It is joy. It is peace. It is long suffering. It is gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. You should never cease looking for these things and trying to acquire these things. There's no law against them. Just like there's no law against asking God for wisdom. He gives liberally. He's not going to chastise you for asking for wisdom. So against such, there is no law. And they that are Christ, they have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and with the lust, meaning that you have self-control and these things will not shackle you. When you walk down the road and you see a lady or a gentleman, they may be faring well in the outward appearance. Where does your mind take you? Where does it take you? Self-control. Self-control. So that's one area that truly trips us up in our quest for spiritual growth. And then there comes patience. Patience just speaks about steadfastness, consistency, endurance. Not swerving from deliberate purpose and loyalty to faith by even the greatest trials and sufferings. Now, this is a big ingredient. This ingredient of patience is huge. It's important. Not swerving from deliberate purpose and loyalty to faith, even by even the greatest trials and sufferings. When we attempt to embark on this journey with Jesus, trials, they will come. They must come. The sufferings, they will come. They must come. But how much patience do you have? How much patience do you have? How consistent are you in your profession to Jesus? The trials come. You stop going to church. I ain't going back. You ain't know the hardship that I'm facing. You don't know what I'm going through. Let me just get a little break. Let me just get a little breather for myself. No consistency. You're here with Jesus today. You're somewhere else tomorrow. Up and down, vacillating, vacillating, vacillating. And forgetting the deliberate purpose that you've signed up for in the beginning. If we look quickly at the explanation in the parable of the sower, in Luke chapter 8, in verse 11, when Jesus began to explain this parable, he said, now the parable is this. The seed that the sower went out to plant, that is the word of God. Verse 15, the seed that was planted in one instance, it fell on good ground. And it says, but that on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, by having heard the word, they kept it and brought forth fruit with patience. It means the same thing. That same word patience there. When the word of God falls on good ground, when the word of God falls on a heart that is consistent and deliberate in their faith, when the trials come, 
when the persecutions come, they remain steadfast. So therefore, that word that is preached is able to be sown and brings forth fruit. But if you're unsettled and you're vacillating, when the word is preached, the enemy comes and the birds and the fowls of the air comes and picks it away. Because you're not settled on good ground. It brings forth fruit with patience. So remember this patience talks about steadfastness, consistency, and endurance. What does Romans chapter 5, verse 1 to 5 say? It says, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation, it works patience. Tribulations work patience. And patience brings experience. Experience. You have something now that you can share with somebody. You have a testimony now that you can share with somebody to encourage them as they are going through the same that you've been through. Tribulation, it works patience. And patience, experience, and experience, it gives hope. And hope it makes us not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Colossians chapter 1, reading from verse 9. It says, for this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that we might be fulfilled might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. You see that desire? To be filled with wisdom, spiritual understanding. That we might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing and being fruitful to every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. All of these are the ingredients that we are adding into the recipe. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. Unto what? All patience and long suffering. Read the last two words. With joyfulness. I don't know. Long suffering, hardship, any of the like. To be linked with joyfulness. In the normal sense of our thinking, we don't link those words together. Who links pain with joyfulness, long suffering with joyfulness, hardship with joyfulness? But it's expected of us. That's what's expected. According to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. And thanksgiving, giving thanks to the Father which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. So right into this pot, we have some ingredients. We started first and foremost with faith, our profession. And that is what each and every one of us need to start with if we want to see the end result, which is right living, which is spiritual growth. We need to start there with that foundation. And then with diligence, you know, sometimes they say, Mix on high speed or mix with moderate speed or mix on, on low speed. But this one, you're mixing on high speed. With all diligence, but not carelessly. With all diligence, we are to add virtue 
We are to add knowledge. We are to add temperance. We are to add patience. And that's what we have seen thus far. And if you have noticed, these four steps that I gave you, these four ingredients that you were to add, these four ingredients dealt solely with self. Dealt with self. To your faith, add virtue. That is moral excellence, the way you conduct yourself. Moral excellence. The way you carry yourself and your thoughts and your actions. Moral excellence, dealing with self. And to that virtue, knowledge. Again, self. Dealing with yourself. Temperance, which is self-control. Dealing with yourself. Patience. Who's that to deal with? Yourself. And there are seven steps. And out of the seven steps, the majority is dealing with self. You see, spiritual growth is not highly dependent on relationships with others, but is highly dependent, I would say, on the success that you give in self, making sure that you have these four ingredients and have them mastered. Once these four ingredients are mastered, the other three that we look at, they will come in alignment very, very nicely. Very nicely. I guarantee you. They'll come in nicely. So these are to deal with self. The simplicity of the gospel.